we have a public lecture today from Olivier Paul Wee, who is a professor in the Chaos Center at the Quran Institute of Mathematical Sciences and a co-principal investigator in the Center for Prototype Climate Modeling. Olivier is a star of atmospheric science focusing on clouds in the tropics and subtropics. His work blends ideas of moist thermodynamics, comprehensive com computer models, ingenious data diagnostics, in a very unique amalgam of work. He's written two very important papers, pres uh, published in the most prestigious high uh, visibility general journal, Science, and a very high visibility paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science of the United States. And so it's with great pleasure I want to introduce Olivier Paulwe to give his talk on the climate mosaic, understanding the hidden patterns of clouds, winds, and weather. Olivier. So, uh, yeah, so my talk today is uh, basically on the, the, the climate mosaic, um, so understanding the hidden patterns of clouds, uh, winds, and weather. Uh, so, so what I would like to, uh, before that, so as, as I need, already did the introduction, um, so I, I would like to, to mention a little bit, so, so the Center for Prototype Climate Modeling, so we're having our first workshop uh, this week in Abu Dhabi, uh, and so this is of course the NYU Abu Dhabi campus, uh, this is actually where we're located in New York at the Study Center for Atmosphere Ocean Science, which is part of the Crown Institute, which uh, essentially functions as the, 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 the mathematics department uh, of New York University, and that's the, uh, the Warren River building in, in New York by, by Washington Square, uh, if you stop by. Uh, uh, New York City. Um, and um, so the, the topic of my talk today is, um, so I, I call the, the, the climate mosaic, and I want to I wanna draw an analogy basically between the mosaic and, and what happens is when you look at too closely to, 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 uh, to a mosaic, it looks very disorganized and it's, it may be, it may be a, bit, a, a little bit confusing, but of course once you, you take a step back, then you can, you can appreciate all the, the, the organization and the beauty of it. And um, from my point of view, a lot of it is, has to do also the same, the same, the same aspect apply, apply with the atmosphere and the, the weather. Um, in, if you look too closely at the weather, it looks, it looks extremely chaotic. The weather that you have today may change tomorrow. It's, um, it changes on every, every day, every hour, every time scale. Um, yet, if you, if, you, if you look from backwards, so if you look, if you look from further back, you can, you can start to discern specific patterns. Uh, in, in the atmosphere, especially so, some of these patterns associated with the atmospheric circulation, how the air moves around the globe. And this is, this is a specific problem I would like to discuss and introduce to you. <coughs> so uh, in, that, in that analogy, I would like to, to, to push it a little bit more and uh, draw the analogy between essentially the fundamental aspect of a, of a mosaic and basically you have, you have one, the first part is the tiles. So what are the basic components that are leading the organization or, or the, the basic foundation element of the mosaic, and in the case of the atmosphere, one of the basic, one of the basic components, if you look at any, any picture of the Earth, is basically the presence of clouds and the role of water vapor. So I'll talk a little bit about what are these clouds, wh why do, do we have clouds, where do we find them, what type of clouds we have. Um, and then the second aspect is basically how these stars are organized. And, and so what, part of what's controlling the organization of the clouds is as related to basically the winds. Uh, basically, the, the, the winds moving water vapor around, around the atmosphere and, and, leading, and, and leading to the formation of clouds. Uh, and then the last part, uh, it's the most subtle and, and, and related to uh, some of the work that, that I've been doing, it has to do with basically what happens when you try to uh, make sense. So, by, 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 by uh, looking, trying to find some, some, some way of understanding the circulation by doing some kind of averaging. And uh, the analogy was. was, was, was Basically, the mosaic here is that um, what you perceive depends a lot from your, your, your point of view, from the angle at which you're looking at the picture. And uh, similar things apply uh, mathematically when you, look, when you look at the atmosphere and this, this mean circulation. The way that you look at the circulation, the way that you average the circulation, has a clear big impact on how you end up perceiving it or describing it. And so I would like, I would like to explain this, this a little bit more detail. So, um, when you talk about the climate mosaic, this is, this is actually a movie. This is probably uh, one of my favorite movies. I end up probably watching it every, 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 every week or every other week, uh, just looking at it. Uh, so what you see here is basically uh, 
a month, uh, a month of the atmosphere, and so it's here is presented in a loop. Uh, so it's continuous recycling. Um, uh, I'll explain in more detail what exactly we're really seeing here, but you basically have, you can see the different continents. So you have Australia over here, you see, you see, we're over there in, in, in the Persian, in, in the Gulf. Uh, there's New York is over there. Um, and so it's every, every snapshot here represents a three hour, a three hour, uh, it's taken every three hours. So we have about one minute, the, the, the whole movie takes about one minute, and it's about a month, uh, a month of observation of the atmosphere. So, um, so what we see in particular has to do with uh, what we call the amount of uh, infrared radiation that is emitted by the Earth. Um, and particularly when, when you look at that, so this is, this is uh, to illustrate what, what you see here, this is a picture of a cloud, uh, of a deep cloud. This is uh, in the region of Kenya. And so what you see here is, is this, this very large, what we call an anvil cloud. And it's, this guy is sitting at about 12, 12 to 15 kilometer high. So the vertical extent here of this cloud between the surface to the top is maybe 12 to 15 kilometer. The horizontal extent is maybe uh, 80 kilometer and 100 kilometer. So this is, this is what we call a deep convection. This is what you experience. This is a thunderstorm. So this is a thunderstorm from, view from above. So view probably from a, uh, from, from, from a, um, a space shuttle. Um, and so for, from, from the point of view of the, the, the movie I just showed you, uh, uh, the, the key physical law has to do with the fact that uh, any physical body emits infrared radiation. Uh, so we, we, we're doing that right now. We, we basically, any physical object which has a certain temperature emits a certain amount of infrared radiation that is related to the temperature of the object. And um, when you look at the atmosphere, one of the important aspects of the atmosphere has to do with whenever you go up, uh, the temperature decreases. Uh, that's true up to height of, of, of 15 kilometers about here. And so the temperature actually of, these, of the, the top of these clouds is very cold. It's about minus 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, so I guess minus 200, uh, or 200 degrees Kelvin. So that's minus 70 degrees Celsius. Um, and as a result of having a very low temperature, these clouds emit very, very little amount of infrared radiation. In contrast, any, if, you, if you look at the region at the surface, the surface is much warmer. So it's on average, uh, 15 degrees Celsius, it can be, of course, warmer. Uh, and so the, the region, the surface of the Earth emits much, much larger amount of infrared radiation. Um, one of the issues when, when, you, when you look at things like basically green, the greenhouse effect and, and global warming has to do with the fact that the amount of infrared radiation that can escape uh, to space depends on, on the atmospheric concentration. But uh, for, for the point of view I'm concerned today, it's what I, uh, the, the main focus has to do with um, the difference of energy being emitted associated with uh, infrared radiation emitted at, at the cloud top at these very high clouds and the, the amount of infrared radiation emitted by the surface of the Earth, so it makes a big difference. So if we go back to the movie, um, to, to, to this animation, so what you see essentially is the, the, this, this very wide region and see corresponding to very low temperatures, so they basically satellites measurement of the amount of energy or infrared, or red, uh, infrared emission uh, from the Earth. So they translate the amount of energy in terms of temperature um, and so the, the very, very wide region corresponds to very low temperature associated in effect with very high clouds that you find in the equatorial region. Uh, the darker region corresponds to region where you can actually see all the way to, uh, in, in the, 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 the infrared spectrum, you can see all the way to the Earth. So you can, for example, if you look at Australia right over here, um, you, can, you, you can essentially notice uh, the diurnal cycle. So you see the, the warming and cooling associated with, with the daily variation. Uh, you, can see, you can see a lot of detail on the movie. So, for example, this is, uh, the movie is taken in the, uh, in, the, in the month of July. And so you can see, for example, here all the, all the activity, all the cloud center over, over India associated with the, uh, with the summer monsoon. Uh, if you keep, keep looking at certain things, you can see you can catch uh, there are a few hurricanes that, 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 and, and typhoons. I think there's one right over there. Uh, you, can see, you can see various types of weather system. Uh, you can see in the mid latitude, you can see certain uh, some of these bigger we uh, weather systems associated. If you live in New York City with a fluctuation uh, of weather on a two to five day, day time scale, so the alternance of nice weather, bad weather. So if you look at New York City, it might be nice weather, and then a few days later you get, you, 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 get, you get rain and so forth. So if you look at this picture, there's a lot of motion. It seems to be popping in, in, in all, all very different way, in very complex way. But if you try to, to, to abstract things a little bit, uh, you, can, you can notice, to, 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 you, you can observe a certain pattern. And so the first thing is um, basically the fact that if you look at the region uh, uh, around, the equator, uh, around the equator, 
uh, you find a lot of these very high clouds basically being in, in the equatorial region. When if you look right north and south with particularly in a region like, like, like the subtropical region where, where Abu Dhabi is located, you find actually that you find much, much fewer of these clouds. So, so you find the very moist region in the equatorial region associated with, with a lot of these, these, these deep convection, these very, very, very severe thunderstorm. And then you find the, the, the subtropical region where you find most of the desert region, so like Australia, uh, North Africa. Uh, also the, 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 southwest, the southwest of the United States. And then if you go further north, you find that the, the last part is this region of the mean latitude where you see, where you have this big, um, this big swirly motion over here, so that's associated with uh, the type, what, what we call the storm track, so this, uh, this weather system in the latitude. And finally, further north, we have the polar region. Um, and so, um, so, so these different, so, so, so what I would like to try is to explain today is basically what is giving rise of this different region, what are the characters of this, this different region, and how do we think about them from a, from a climate point of view. Um, and so, of course, the first thing about this region has to do with the fact that they characterize with basically different type of weather, and given the fact that, that one of the things I'm very concerned with is, is basically clouds, they also characterize with very different type of, of cloud system. Uh, Sometimes you have no clouds, and, and as, as it happened, uh, uh, for example, here very, very quite often. But you also find a lot in the subtropics, you find, you find uh, a lot of these what we call shallow convection. Uh, so in this case, shallow cumulus clouds uh, in different types. So you find these, these smaller clouds. This, this is a little bit bigger. This is a, a not so shallow, but it's still, it's still going up to maybe a height of maybe one or two kilometers in the atmosphere, so it's rising. Or rising over there, so it's a, a isolated shallow, shallow cumulus clouds. And of course, this is another type of, this is a picture that's coming from uh, Italy, uh, so where you see, to, to illustrate the fact that these clouds, so some of these clouds are very shallow, so you have these, uh, these almost a sea of, of, in this case, stratocumulus cloud, and you have, you have mountain here. So the, these clouds tend to be very often a cap at maybe an altitude of, of one or two kilometer. Uh, so so they, they remain confined to the lower portion of the atmosphere. So in contrast, uh, oh, that, that's, another, uh, that's another picture of, of some of these clouds. So that, that's to show it's of the Canary Islands. So we have the Canary Island of, of Africa. And you have this region where you have uh, shallow clouds. And what's happening here is you have wind blowing uh, from this direction, so from, from the northeast. And as it blows back, there, there is some, some fairly large mountain over the Canary, Canary Island. And as it blows back, you see the effect of the wind uh, generating what we call uh, a vortex street. Uh, in the back of the wind. So, so the, these, these are very shallow clouds, so they, they, they're very close to the surface of the Earth uh, by atmospheric standards, so maybe one or two kilometers above, above the Earth. Uh, the other type of the cloud is basically correspond to the one I already showed you before. It's basically what we call deep convection, uh, and essentially your cumulonimbus, uh, which is basically what you associate it with, what, what would be associated with a thunderstorm. Uh, and heavy precipitation. And so these clouds are quite different. Uh, for, for one thing, they're much, much bigger. Uh, so rather than being one or two kilometers in depth, they basically stretch uh, what we call the entire extent of, of the troposphere. So they extend up to about 15 kilometers in height, uh, which, which account for about 90% of the mass of the atmosphere. So you have this deep, deep cloud. They rise here. You can see at the top of this region, you see this kind of bubbliness indicating there's uh, very strong motion in turbulence. And then usually what happens is that when they, when they reach uh, this level of 15 kilometers, they start to encounter air that is quite lighter uh, than, than the, the, the air, air passes in the cloud. And so once they, they reach this air that is lighter, they stop rising and they start to spread around in these in this large uh, anvil clouds, so sitting, sitting very high in, in the atmosphere. And so when we look at this, this animation of the, of the infrared radiation of the, of the Earth, um, these are, these are these basically wide region associated with these, these big anvil clouds. Hmm. Um, this is another picture, so, 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 so it's a similar picture of these clouds, so, so this is over a region, uh, so I think this is over the Midwest, so where we see several of these, these deep clouds organized in this case what we call a squan line, uh, so it's a line of these, these deep convective clouds that is moving uh, systematically uh, uh, across, across the region. In this case, you see, you see very nicely around that, you see these deep clouds that, that reach very high up in the atmosphere, and right next to it, for comparison, you see a lot of these shallow clouds that would be associated with uh, nice weather cumulus clouds. Um, 
One important thing when, when we look at these clouds is, of course, that, that uh, uh, from a metrical point of view, we can, we can distinguish between these clouds. One way to find them and to, to separate them has to do with this, this infrared radiation, the amount of infrared radiation that we see. And when, particularly, if we compare the amount of radiation coming, so, so the reflection of, of sunlight by these clouds. So here we see this, all these regions where you have uh, all these clouds basically are made of, of water droplet of ice crystal. They reflect a lot of radiation. So you see, you see all the region associated with these clouds. You see them equally well uh, in the visible light. If you then start to look in the infrared radiation, you see the difference between these very high clouds and these shallow clouds. So, uh, for example, the, the, the region of the, 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 the west coast of continents, so west coast of Africa, but also the west coast of US out of Los Angeles, this region is characterized by a large amount of these, these low level clouds. In contrast, right in this equatorial region, uh, you, see, you see this very, very, very deep cloud uh, located, uh, located right there. One of the very interesting characteristics of the atmosphere has to do with that. If you look at actually the, the variation of the height of the cloud, you see that in this region, you have these very high clouds sitting, sitting right in, in the equator, a little bit north of the equator. But right next to that region, we have region where you have massive region where you find mostly, mostly very, very, very low level clouds. And so one of the questions is, is why is there such a sharp contrast between this region where it's very deep, uh, very deep clouds and, 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 and semi-permanent thunderstorm we're sitting right next to a region where there's very, very shallow, very, I mean, overall very nice weather. Okay, so, so, so one of the questions is why do we have clouds in the atmosphere? Uh, and and may, may, maybe, maybe it's obvious for everyone, uh, but it's worth explaining, re-explaining why it's the case. So uh, if, you, if you consider an air parcel, so, so the air is made, it's composed of basically nitrogen, oxygen, uh, a little bit of argon, a little bit of carbon dioxide, but there's also water vapor. Uh, and water vapor is, is a very interesting uh, aspect of, of, of the Earth's atmosphere because it's uh, one, the one component of the, of the atmosphere that can be found in basically different phases. So you can find water both as a gas, so as water vapor, as a liquid, or as a solid in ice. And um, this is actually a very unique characteristic of the Earth's atmosphere where you compare to the other planet of the weather system, the fact that there is actually a lot of water vapor in it uh, that's continuous change phase. So there's a very active hydrological cycle, and if you look at the other planet of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the solar system, you won't find a planet that has similar, uh, a similar hydrological cycle. Uh, there's a small exception, which is Titan, which is one of the satellites of, of uh, Jupiter, I think. Uh, which has some, to some extent, you have some, some kind of hydrological cycle, but most of the, uh, all, none of the other planets, at least, uh, exhibit a similar properties. And so, so, so if, you have, if you have water vapor in the air, um, what happens is that as, as you have an air parcel that moves up, uh, so it experiences, so, so uh, as the air parcel moves up, uh, the pressure uh, around that air parcel, the air pressure on that air parcel drops. And so, uh, one thing that's the, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, the pressure in the atmosphere is related to the mass of the atmosphere. It's roughly given by the mass of, of air above, above that point in the atmosphere. So the pressure at the Earth's surface here is about uh, 1,000 millibar, which corresponds to a mass of about 10 meters of water uh, uh, and at every location. And so as an air parcel goes up, the pressure it experiences goes down. So it's, it's reduced, and the air parcel expands. As the air parcel expands, it has to push the air around it, so its volume increases and its temperature drops. And the reason for that is that the parcel expands, it exists a certain amount of work on the, on the environment, and that requires energy to be provided, and the only energy is coming from, from the thermal energy, the temperature. So any air parcel that moves up, basically, uh, see its temperature drops. And uh, the other physical law that is relevant here is the fact that the amount of water vapor that can be present in the air depends on the temperature. And it's, it's a highly sensitive on temperature. So any change of by, by about one degree, a temperature increase by one degree, increase the amount of water vapor that the air can hold by about 6%. So at some point, if you have an air parcel that moves up, it will, it will reach a point where, where condensation starts, and then the, the, the water vapor starts to condense, condense and form the, 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 these very tiny droplets initially, then then grow bigger and, and get your precipitation. But the, 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 short, the short story then is that every, every time you see a cloud in the atmosphere, most of the time when you see a cloud in the atmosphere, it's because you have air going up. So this variation in cloud pattern, you can view the, 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 the presence of cloud in the, of the atmosphere as a, as a pretty good indication of, of air, air, air moving up. Um, and so, so, so if we go back to, 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 this, uh, to this movie here, um, so we can see this, this difference in, in, in the different... Um, 
weather patterns for this cloudy region in the tropics uh, in the equatorial region basically has yes, a region where on average air goes up. Um, similarly, if we look at the subtropics where there's very little of that of this, this cloud, it's a, it's a region on that where on average air moves down. And then the last part is when we look at this weird thing happening in the, in the, in the extra tropic in the mid latitude, it's uh, where, where we have this alternance of uh, a cloudy and uncloudy region. It's actually a region of the atmosphere where the air tends to go up and down uh, on this frequency of five, five to seven, every five to seven days. So you have a lot of air parcels that keep, that keep moving up and down, which give you this alternance between cloudy, non-cloudy, uh, non-cloudy period. And so um, associated with this, so, so, so the point is uh, associated with this distribution of clouds and, and weather system that we see, there is essentially a circulation pattern. So with air going up in certain region, air going down, uh, another region, and this is, this is a very systematic aspect of the atmosphere, so where we see this broad region of air going down in the tropics, region of air going up in the, in the equatorial region, and then this kind of alternance of what we call eddy motion, so air going up and down. Um, interestingly, uh, uh, so, so, so the, the presence of this kind of broad global circulation is actually something that people have had some, some intuition for, for a very long time. And uh, I'm bringing the case of Columbus, uh, but I'm pretty sure there's been other examples that, that one could find that, that, that indicate uh, uh, the, the, this knowledge. And so we all know that Columbus basically de decided that um, uh, the, the, his purpose was to basically find a, a westward road to China. And of course, the, the main motivation was to avoid to having to cross, uh, to cross the, 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 the Ottoman Empire at the time. Uh, and so he was hoping to find, to find a way, a trade route uh, to China and, uh, by, by going west. Um, what is a little bit less known about, about his trip is that, so in order to, to find his road, he didn't sail west directly. Um, he actually, this is, this is a map of, of the trip of his, of his first voyage in, in 1492. And actually what, what Columbus, rather than sailing directly west, he actually started by going south. And actually, he, he set sail out of, out of Spain and basically stopped by Canary Islands actually for several weeks there. Um, and what he was doing there, so he was first refilling water, but actually the reason he felt he, he sailed south is um, at the time, uh, they, you know, he was traveling with a sailboat. So if you have a sailboat, it's much easier to go in the direction of the wind than to go against the wind. And uh, the, the Portuguese had, uh, had been in the Canary Islands for long enough at the time that they knew actually that in the Canary Islands, the wind that the, 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 the mean wind in the, in the Canary Islands is blowing from the east. And so by, by coming south all the way to the Canary Islands and then sailing west, he took advantage of the fact that if he wanted to have very good wind to, 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 to travel westward, he could, actually, he could actually find such a wind uh, in, in, the, in the subtropical region, so by the Canary Islands. Um, Actually, the story is quite interesting is that actually he got very good, very good wind that were, that, 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 that were pushing him toward the west. So he made a very good, a very good space uh, to, cross, to cross the Atlantic. But actually, he, he got quite concerned that actually he was going too fast uh, and was very worried. Uh, he, he wrote in his, his journal, he was basically very worried about, about his crew uh, rebelling against him. And for the very simple reason is that the sailor realized, oh, we have this very great wind that is pushing him west. Uh, but then comes the question is, how do we get back? Uh, and so uh, what, what Columbus is actually decided to, to under-report to his sailors uh, the distance that he traveled every day. And so he, he wrote in his, in, his, in his journal basically the fact that, oh, I, this is what I told my crew, and, and, but actually that's so much we've traveled. Um, he got lucky that basically he was able to, uh, to, hit, uh, to, to hit Cuba, and so basically they were able to refill and so on, to, 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 to get some fresh water. He discovered... Uh, I guess he discovered America at that point, so he made, he made history in, 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 in doing so. Um, he got also extremely lucky uh, on the weather side of things, uh, because he, so he, knew, he knew that actually September was a very good time for him to sail across the Atlantic, where he, he has very good wind. What he didn't know is that it was also the, the peak of the hurricane season in the Atlantic, uh, but he got lucky actually for his first trip that to avoid, to avoid any, any direct uh, hurricane yet otherwise maybe would never heard about, about America and, and, and Columbus uh, again. The last part to, to mention is that on his way back, uh, so he was sitting here in a subtropical region, so the wind is blowing from the east, um, so it's not a very good way for him to, 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 to go back, and so what he did is basically decided to sail northward, and, and by sailing northward, he was able to find a clear region 
when the wind is blowing from the opposite direction. So he was able to get out of this region of wind blowing, blowing from the easterlies uh, and find region of westerly wind was able to, to then get back to Europe. Um, these, uh, these, these wind patterns become very important uh, in the 16th, 17th century and uh, become known as the trade winds. And so the reason that we were known with the trade winds, basically they, uh, this is a map from uh, uh, the 18th century um, that basically show all these regions associated with the trade winds, so basically wind, wind blowing from the east. And so the, 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 these, these wind patterns become very important for the trade, for the, the transatlantic trade, in particular, so, so basically from sailor from Europe, moving, moving to Africa, uh, and, and, and being involved with slave, uh, slave trade over there, and so basically moving to Africa, taking advantage of the wind, flying, uh, flying to America, uh, sorry, not flying, sailing to America, um, and then coming back, coming back to Europe uh, uh, to the mean latitude. Um, as, 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 as we hear in Abu Dhabi, it might be worth pointing out that there is one exception uh, around the, the one exception around the globe about the presence of these, these trade winds, the easterly wind in the tropics, as occurring on the, on, the, on the Arabian Sea. So the one region where you would not necessarily expect the trade wind uh, is basically this, this, this part of the world, uh, in part due to the presence of India and the, and the, and the monsoon in that region. Um, and so, um, basically, the European sailors started to realize, sailing around the globe, uh, that these trade winds are some semi-permanent feature of the atmosphere, and so they started uh, it was also in the time when they started to think scientifically about things, and so it started to be actually a scientific question. So why do we have trade winds? And uh, several, se several scientists proposed explanations. So I think Galileo had an explanation. Uh, Halley, at an, uh, the astronomer Halley of the, the, the comet, also had a different explanation. But actually, uh, the explanation that survived is actually the one that was provi uh, provoked, uh, provi provided by George Adley in, in 1735, who is the first one who provides an explanation for what's going on. And its explanation is essentially uh, tied to the idea that there is a global circulation in the atmosphere. And the reason for global circulation in the atmosphere has to do with the fact that we know that the tropical regions tend to be warmer because they receive more, more energy from the sun, while the polar regions are colder. And so if we have warmer in one region, colder in another region, what we do expect is for the air, the air to rise up you know, over the warm region to start to sink over, over the colder region. So we expect some kind of broad overturning circulation associated with air rising in the, in the, in the tropic and equatorial region and moving down uh, over the polar region. Um, and um, that itself doesn't explain why you would have uh, wind blowing from the east in the subtropics. But then if you combine that with the fact that the, the, the Earth is rotating. So if you think of, of, of the Earth is rotating, and the Earth is rotating, so basically um, uh, from west to east. Uh, so if you look at the, at, the, at the speed of the solid Earth, so if you think of a, of a parcel sitting, moving at the same speed as the Earth, maybe in the mid-latitude right over here, the velocity of that parcel, so if you move that parcel, keeping the velocity, oh, technically it's what we call angular momentum, but let's, let's just think in terms of velocity. Uh, if you move that parcel, its velocity as it moves toward the equator, its velocity is less than the velocity of the solid Earth, for the reason that basically the solid Earth moves much faster here when you're at the equator than if, you, if, you, if you're in a unimil latitude. So any parcels that you take that is moving with the solid body rotation of the Earth in the mid-latitude is moving toward the equator will develop a westward, a westward component to its velocity. So any parcels that move toward the equator basically start to, 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 get, to get an acceleration uh, to be accelerated toward the west. Um, this is known as, as the Coriolis, Coriolis effect uh, when it was discovered or rediscovered. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the 18th century, uh, 19th century. Um, and so associated with this, this pattern, this global circulation, now we have, we have a region, we have air going up here in the, in the equatorial region, we have air subsiding. It's also tied to basically this global trade wind uh, and this global circulation. Um, and so uh, if we go back now to, 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 to this idea of the circulation to tie things up, so we have now this circulation, this overturning circulation, and so if we, if we look at the region, like in the, 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 the Pacific, the Eastern Pacific, where you have this deep, deep cloud separated right next to it with, with the shallow clouds, so what's happening here is that we have this global pattern, this global circulation on a planetary scale, and this circulation now is, is known as the, the Alice circulation, where we have this uh, region of convergence of air rising up. So we have convergence at lower level, air rising up, and then 
diverging, so moving away from the equator at upper level. So we have, and associated with this rising motion, we have this, this deep convection, this, this, this precipitation region. Then we have air going, coming down and basically preventing convection from going up. So we have shallow convection in the subtropics. And so this contrast between the very moist tropical equatorial region, very dry subtropical region, is really a direct consequence of having this, 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 this global planetary scale circulation that we call the LA circulation. Uh, it's also tied with the air that's moving up is tied to the presence of the jet stream, so the very strong wind that you find also tied with basically this motion over here uh, and, and, and the, the rotation of the Earth. Um, from a point of view of this circulation, it's of course the same circulation if you look in terms of precipitation, so that's the amount of precipitation measured by, by, by satellites. So what you see is that the, this, this region of, of high clouds is also a region of, of very high precipitation. So this, this planetary circulation is in, 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 in large part responsible for why you have very, 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 very wet region along the equator, in this case the monsoon, and very dry region in region where on average air moves down uh, associated with this early circulation. Um, one thing that is, is, is worth pondering, so, so um, Hadley, Hadley made, made this discovery, uh, proposed this explanation in, in the, in the, in the uh, 18th century, and about a century later, then there started to be some issue with actually showing that the pattern that, that, that Hadley had identified was somewhat incorrect. Uh, so that's what scientific stand, scientists tend to do, is that when someone proposes an ID, uh, you try to show it's wrong as, as soon as you can. Um, and so, so what happened actually in the 19th century is that it, uh, it's basically, um, you know, it took another century of people sailing around the globe, and so there was more and more data was available. Uh, and in particular, this uh, Maury uh, was uh, um, uh, working for the U.S. government at the time, but collected a large amount of data and actually looked at, at analyzed the data, basically, and, and collected some of that data. And so what he realized is that actually, if you look at the data, it's true that in the tropical region, you have air rising at the equator, subsiding in the subtropics. But if you look in the mean latitude, on average, actually, the air is going in the opposite direction. Um, and so, so, so he found that actually this, the, the pattern described uh, by, by Hadley to explain the trade wind actually applies very well for the tropical region, but what's going on in the, in the mid-latitude is quite, it's quite different. Um, to show a little bit of more, a more modern version of it, it's basically, so, so I, I redid this calculation. Now we have, we have uh, access to much, much more data than, 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 than Farrell or, or Hadley had at the time. And so, so I, I want to show some, some calculation. So associated with basically taking, taking the velocity, the north-south velocity, so that V, and basically averaging over a certain period of time along the, the, the longitude, so we can mean velocity. And from that, we, I compute what is called a stream function, which is basically uh, uh, mathematically the integral of, 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 the, of the velocity. But this stream function is basically this line along which the mean velocity is organized, so the basically circulation. So the blue, along the blue, the air is going in, in, um, uh, in the clockwise direction, the red circle, the, the, the red contour corresponds to counterclockwise. This is latitude, this is pressure. So in the tropical region, we see this overturning with air rising at the equator, moving, moving away from the equator at upper level, subsiding in subtropics, and so on. What Ferrell discovered is the fact that in the mean latitude, when you look at this average circulation, uh, you find circulation, basically the air is moving in the opposite direction. So schematically, this is correspond to, in the, equator, in the tropical region, you find this two other circulation. And in the mean latitude, you find the, the reverse pattern associated with what we call now the, fer the feral cell, with basically air rising uh, somewhere around 50 degree latitude, moving, moving toward the equator, subsiding over the subtropics. Um, and so the, the, the one issue with this feral cell, it, it poses a little bit of a problem, is that, so Ali's explanation was, uh, was actually quite good in that it argued that actually the circulation was associated with the need for the atmosphere to transport energy from the equator to the pole. If you, uh, so because simply to compensate the fact that we receive more energy at the equator, less energy, less energy in the polar region from the sun. Um, this feral cell has, has the problem that it transports energy in the wrong direction. And for that, it has to do with the fact that the energy, the energy of, uh, of an air parcel is higher as you go up. It's the amount of energy of the air parcel is tied both to temperature and geopotential energy to its height. And so this, this feral cell in the mid latitude is actually associated with energy transport in the wrong direction. So it tried to transport energy from the pole to the equator. Um, and so um, this is a little bit of an oddity. 
Uh, and it has to do with the fact that actually the mean, the mean circulation, the mean velocity that you see in the mid-latitude is tied to the fact that actually you're not really ever, the, is the fact that the, the, this, this region is characterized by this storm track, by this basically big swirly motion with air going up and down, but it's also air that, if you look at this, this, this movie, you can see that is, this air is also moving north and south at all time. So what you're trying to do is you're really trying to average a north-south motion, uh, so, so, so you do, you do this, this complex averaging uh, that, that basically give you the mean, the mean velocity out of that. Um, I don't know how much time I have, actually. Can I keep, how long, how long am I supposed to keep going? Okay. Um, I'm, just, I'm just trying to find two, 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 two now, uh, anyway. Uh, so this is another picture that, that is basically, that, that, that's a little bit of an illustration uh, from another famous meteorologist from the, from the early 20th century, uh, Bjorknes, uh, so Swedish meteorology. Um, and so, so, so in his drawing, so we reproduce here the drawing with the, with the LA circulation in the tropics, the feral cell in mid-latitude. But next we just actually show what he, what, what he would describe as the motion of actually air parcels. And so in the mid-latitude, we have the mean velocity, so the average velocity, but then the other side we have what, is, what, what Bjergnes thought was the motion of the actual air parcels, with air parcels actually moving, uh, moving across the latitude and actually traveling in the opposite, in the different direction from what, what is the, the, mean, the mean circulation. This, this issue has to do with something that is known in fluid mechanics uh, between what we call the, the Eulerian description of the flow versus the Lagrangian description of the flow. So in the Eulerian description, we try to describe the, the property of the flow associated in a fixed point in space. So we try to basically average the properties uh, at a given location in space. But of course, if we're talking about the fluid, we're talking about something where everything is moving in, 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 in various directions at the same time. So fixed point in space doesn't correspond to the same, the same parcel at all time. And so if we describe the motion of air parcels, we call about the Lagrangian description. Um, it's basically a description of the property of the, the, the fluid following a specific air parcel. And so the, the name, the difference between Eulerian and Lagrangian is basically referring to uh, two mathematicians from the 18th century, Euler and, and Lagrange. Um, and so one of the important aspects of this, of this description is that when you try to, 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 to look at the circulation, if you try to do this averaging either from an Eulerian point of view or from a Lagrangian point of view, there is no guarantee that, that these, these averaging should, should give you the same, uh, the same answer. The classic example of that problem has to do with, with what happens actually if you have a water wave. Uh, so it's called it's called a stoke drift. And so if you have a water wave, so it's basically uh, so it's a, it's any any kind of wave you have, you have in water, either in your bathtub or over the ocean. So we have this oscillation of the of the surface of the surface of the water, and associated with that, at any fixed point in space, you can show mathematically that the solution corresponds to a cyclical motion uh, at, at a fixed point in space. But if you if you if you try to look at the at the circulation, so so if it's cyclic motion, so the at this point in space, the mean velocity at that point will be zero. It will basically describe a perfect circle. The velocity describes a perfect circle. The mean velocity is zero. Um, but if you look at the motion of the air parcels, uh, or, or the water parcels, actually, if you look at, at what happened in this animation, so what happened is that the motion, the parcels start to move. They start to move up and down. But because the amplitude of the, of the motion increase, increase with height, actually, as the parcel sits on top of that, of that trajectory, it moves faster that when it moved back a, a little bit below. And so, in addition to having this, this semi-cyclical, this, this semi-periodic motion, there is a drift, there is a continuous drift of the, of, of, of the parcel associated with the wave. Uh, and so, for example, if you look at a region where there's wave, that's why you have, so for example, on the beach where you have continuous wave, so the motion of the, of the, of the, of the fluid parcel is the same direction as the motion of the wave. That's why you have accumulation, for example, of driftwood on the beach uh, so on, on the motion of, of the water at the, top, uh, at the top of the wave is in the same direction as the motion of the wave. So if you have a beach where you have continuous wave coming to the beach, they, they keep pushing partly the water on the top uh, is, uh, where, where, where the wood would be located. It's basically continuously moving toward the beach. And so, so the key point here is that the mean velocity that you average at, at one point in space is not the same thing as the mean velocity of the air parcel. Uh, or in this case, the water parcel. And so to discuss that, uh, uh, so, so, so that there's a discussion that, that actually took place in, in atmospheric science in the 70s. 
uh, was actually asking the question whether the, the, this mean velocity that we get from the feral circulation is actually repre is representative or not of the air motion. And uh, one approach that, that, that one can use is basically changing the way we do the averaging uh, for that circulation. And so what, what you can do is rather than doing an average on, on surface of a constant put, uh, location in space, is to use a, a coordinate system, which in this case we call potential temperature, which is basically designed to follow the air parcels. And so the, the potential temperature is a quantity. Um, uh, I'll, I'll stay, uh, I, I, won't, I won't go too much in detail, but it corresponds to the temperature of an air parcels if you bring that, temper, that, that air parcels to the Earth's surface. So if you compress the, the, uh, an air parcels back to the surface, its temperature would reach, would be actually warmer than, 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 than it is because of the compression. And so that, that's this potential temperature. The interesting characteristic of this potential temperature is that it's conserved uh, over or uh, for several days following a parcel, the parcel motion. So by averaging the circulation uh, on, on this, this surface of constant potential temperature, we get the possibility of actually tracking the parcels much better than if we try to, 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 to average it on, on, on surface of constant pressure. And so when you do that and you take the same data set as before and you do this, this averaging, so you just change the, 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 this coordinate system uh, and you do the averaging, what you do find is that what, what appears is that rather than having this three cell structure with the Adley cell in the tropics, uh, the feral cell in the mean latitude, and, the, and, then, and then the polar cell uh, at, at, uh, in the, over the polar region, this three cell structure completely disappear. And actually what happened now is that we have a single overturning circulation, so basically a single global circulation, which actually looked pretty much very much like uh, the description that, 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 that Ali gave, so a global overturning circulation uh, tied with basically air parcels moving at high, high energy moving, moving toward the pole, low energy moving toward the equator. So we have we gone, so by just changing the way that we look at the, at the circulation, by changing the way we do the averaging, we went from having a three cell structure to basically having a single a single overturning cell. I'll just finish by, 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 by mentioning, so from, from a cartoon perspective, if you try to explain the difference is that, so we, we're looking here at a cross-section of mid-latitude where we have here air moving toward the equator, we have air moving toward the pole, and so at a constant level. So if we look at, on average, the air high up in the atmosphere, on average here the air is moving toward the equator, on average here the air would be moving toward the pole. So in this configuration, we basically have a situation corresponding to a feral cell with the, the air is moving at high altitude toward the equator, at low altitude moving toward the pole. But now if we, if we, if we look at this different coordinate system where this is, for example, this surface of, of constant potential temperature, so that define high value of the potential temperature, low value of the potential temperature, if the, the fluctuation of this potential surface basically is, is correlated, so it's, it's, it's capturing some of that poleward and equatorward motion, so we can if we look at the, no, the, the poleward motion, on average, in this, above the surface of potential temperature, we ca we're going to capture a larger chunk of the poleward transport where we capture a bigger portion of the equatorial transport uh, below, below that surface potential temperature. So by doing, by in this configuration, so we can go back from averaging on pressure surfaces uh, or, or constant height, we can have circulation in one direction and just by changing, by having a, a coordinate system that kind of move up and down with the motion of the air, we can actually reverse, reverse the, 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 the circulation. Um, and so that, that's, uh, that's in effect what's happening. So there's this fluctuation of this potential temperature, which are, which are tied to fluctuation of temperature of the air that is basically correlated with the direction of the wind. So we have, in effect, in this situation, we have situation we have warm air blowing, blowing toward the, the pole, cold air moving toward the equator that are associated with this fluctuation of these, of these surfaces uh, that explain that when you do the average on these potential temperature surfaces, you get, you get the circulation going in a different direction. Um, I think I'm gonna, uh, and so, so, so the description then we get is basically uh, air rising in the equator moving poleward, but now rather than moving poleward in a kind of straightward fashion, it's actually moving against the mean velocity, but it's moving in this big swirly motion, uh, basically extracting air from, from, from the tropical region in this big swirly motion in mean latitude before it, dry, before it subsides in subtropics. Um, I'm running, I think I'm, I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll maybe uh, cut it a bit short, uh, to just quickly go over, go over the, the, the very last part. Um, this, this motion, this, this movie here is uh, similar to, to the first movie I showed you, 
except that rather than showing you the, 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 the amount of infrared radiation that is coming out of the Earth, it's focused on a very narrow portion of this infrared radiation that is tied actually to the, 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 the frequency at which water vapor emit infrared radiation in the atmosphere. Uh, this is something that is very useful for, for meteorologists because it gives you a good indication of where there is water vapor, uh, the, where there is water vapor in, in, in the atmosphere. And so you see, of course, in the equatorial region, you have a lot of basically this region corresponding to gray region corresponding to a lot of water vapor. The dark region associated with the fine in subtropics, so for example, right over here, corresponds to region actually that are extremely dry. Uh, so so as the, there's very little bit of energy. Um, the part that my, 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 my recent work has been, has been related to has to be the fact that if you look at this big swirly motion, not only they bring warmer to the polar region and bring colder back, back, back to, the, to, 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 to the equatorial region, they also extract a lot of water vapor out of the mid latitude of out of the subtropics. So you have all these water vapor being extracted, moving poleward and, and, and basically feeding all these, these storm uh, and, and raining over, over the mid latitude region. So like New York or like Belgium, where, 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 where I'm from. And so associated with this transport, there is, uh, there is a question of how to, how to account for, for this, this water vapor presence. Uh, and so we did, we did some of that work. So we, we included the effect of, of water vapor in that circulation. And so one of the, the, the interesting things, that there's a way of doing it, uh, basically using, using a concept similar to potential temperature, but that account for the effect of water. And when we did that, we basically identify, uh, we, we, we found that actually uh, we are able to identify a contribution to that transport associated with an increase in the circulation, but I, I'm going to skip on that part uh, and just um, uh, maybe uh, I'll skip. I'll skip. I'll, I'll just I'll just finish that part and just just go and bring the, the conclusion. Uh, so one of the key key aspects is that if we look at the atmospheric circulation, if we look at the variation of climate, if we look at why we have clouds in certain region, why we have dry region where you have more moist region. This is tied to the fact that there is a global pattern in the atmospheric circulation. There is this, this general circulation of the atmosphere that basically is associated with transport of energy, of momentum, but also of water vapor. In particular, we have the tropical region, the equatorial region that are very moist because there's a lot of air converging in that region, bringing uh, water to the, to the tropics. When the subtropics, we have on average air moving down that is basically drying, drying the subtropics. Um, the other aspect which, which, is, uh, uh, which I try to explain is the, the fact that this, this issue of a global circulation really depends on how you compute it, how you look at it. So that has to do with uh, the, this issue of average circulation uh, depends on how you compute the, 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 the average. Um, and so the, this global circulation is basically associated with what's controlling the, the, the local climate is directly tied to, to this variation of this global circulation. Um, and uh, finally, I, I, I'll just leave you with some reference. Uh, there is um, there, there's three, 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 three different reference. Uh, there is this very good book by Gabriel Walker, uh, A Notion of Air, which is, uh, there is no equation. It's, it's, it's a very nice book to read. Uh, it's, it's very well done, explaining a lot of issues. So, so she, 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 she talked about this global circulation. She talked about other issues, like, like basically the, uh, uh, the, 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 the ozone hole and discovery of the ozone hole by, by, by scientists in the 80s. So it's a very good uh, general discussion of, 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 of some of the scientific issues associated with the, the, the atmospheric circulation, but it, it's, very, it's, it's very readable and, and, and very easy to access. Uh, the, the last text is more, 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 distinct, uh, more, 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 more geared toward uh, undergraduate students would be interested in, in going deeper. It's, it's a, a, a manuscript by Ed Lawrence. You can get it through the library uh, at, at, at NYU, uh, which, is, uh, which is kind of a, a, a very good text introduction to this, this, this uh, general circular atmosphere at the, at the undergrad level, at, the, at the, the probably junior or senior level. And then the last part was, was the work I kind of skip at the end, uh, but it's basically related to more recent work, trying to understand the role of water vapor in that, in that circulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
But of course, this is something that you can analyze in, 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 in models. And so, so, so a lot of actually what we're do, discussing about the workshop is basically how to, how to look at the circulation, how the circulation change under various circumstances. Uh, so you can, you can compute the circulation associated with the model. You can compute these various averaging. So you can do that in various coordinate system. And you can do that in model and use that to basically assess a good your, your, your climate model is at reproducing uh, the atmospheric circulation as we know it. And you can also use that in a, in a global warming simulation, try to infer how oh, is the circulation going to change uh, over, over the next century or so as, as the, uh, the planet warms. Um, one, one general aspect, it seems that as, I mean, the, the, these climate simulations tend to indicate that if the, if the, uh, as the, the climate warms, uh, it's very likely that the simulation will slow down a little bit. Uh, so so this, the, the amount of air that is being going to be moved around uh, by this global circulation, uh, it's likely a little bit less air is going to be moved around. Uh, and and one, so, so, so that, that, that seems to be one of the, the consistent results coming from this climate simulation. But it's one of the issues on which the different models not, do not necessarily agree very well with each other. So, so it's, it's, and, and we don't, uh, so, so it's, still, it's still up for debate. But there is a general consensus of this global circulation is going to slow down a little bit. Uh, as a result of, of global warming. Thank you. The weather in Chicago this week has been in the 80s, and we, in March, here in Abu Dhabi, and I've just been here two years, but it's, we've had back-to-back -back shamals or sandstorms in the last month plus. Um, is the, the cause of this across the globe aberration? Is it cyclical? When you look at it long-term, does it have anything to do with a permanent, more permanent climate change? Or what do you attribute the unusual patterns, tornadoes in the US in the you know, early spring like this are very unusual too, where they've occurred? Um, I, do, I, I don't know about the local pattern here in, in, in Abu Dhabi. Um, I mean, it has been very warm in the US. Uh, it has also been very cold in Europe, where it's also, I get, I get my family complaining a lot about how cold it was over Belgium this, this winter. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on, on the, the attribution issue, so try to, to understand what's, what's associated with, with the different weather pattern. It is particularly hard to do this attribution of a specific uh, weather or, or a season to, to, to tie to either global warming or other aspects. So, I mean, one of the elements of, the, of the, 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 the weather pattern is we turn us to do the fact that I think we had a, a La Nina situation in the Pacific, so we had very cold water over the Eastern Pacific, which has a lot of reper repercussion, at least in the, in the, for, for, for the climate over North, North, North America. Uh, but it's, it's very, there is, there is component of the, there is a lot of variation in the climate system. You see that, you see that in the animation in the movie, there is a lot of this variation. A lot of this variation on a short time scale, on a few days, but there is also uh, long, longer, longer internal variability. Uh, I cannot really comment on, on, these, on, on, on these specific cases that you mentioned. I mean, the, you would have to, 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 to make a much more detailed study to say whether these can be associated with a specific pattern or not. But there's very good people in, in the audience that can probably answer the question much better than I could. Do you foresee any uh, major breakthrough discoveries in meteorology in the coming years? Um, we hope so. Uh, I, think, I think there's been actually quite, quite, quite a lot of very good progress. Uh, and, and listening to some of the talk today, there, there's some, some very, very promising results. So for example, in our, in our ability of, of predicting uh, what we call inter, intra-seasonal variability. So, so uh, there, is, there is, for example, if you look at the, 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 um, the extended range weather forecast, Particularly in the tropics, there's a phenomena called the madden julian oscillation, which has a, a quasi-periodicity of maybe 40 to 60 days in the tropics. Uh, and it seems that now, uh, over time, uh, weather forecasting models seem to be able to actually predict uh, with increased accuracy the, the, this, this, this madden julian oscillation, so which gives you ability to uh, predict variability in the weather in the tropics up to maybe 30, 40 days. It doesn't let you predict the exact weather, but it may, for example, uh, help you predict whether there will be a break in the monsoon or uh, there will be increased likelihood of hurricane over, over the Caribbean Ocean, uh, the Caribbean. So, so there, is, there, there are, I think, there is actually an ongoing progress. And, and if you look, 
if you're willing to, to, to wait another 10 years, I think, I think the, the quality of, of, of actually weather forecasting has improved quite dramatically. In particular, our ability of doing prediction on, on, on seasonal time scale. Uh, so, so letting you know ahead of time whether the, 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 the summer will be dry or not in various regions of the world, I think is, is increasing quite dramatically. And so, so that actually one of the aspects uh, of, the, of the center that, 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 that we want to build here in Abu Dhabi is try to, to improve and to find ways of improving the, these kind of uh, long range uh, forecast and, and better prediction and also understanding what kind of prediction one can make on this time scale versus what prediction is impossible to make. Can you describe more uh, in detail about the mathematical uh, oh. equations involved in the simulation? Um, so as I said, there, there was no simulation here. It was, it was data. Uh, so, so coming out, well, OK, there, there was some of the, some of the data is, has been processed by a model. Uh, the, equation, the equation that we're using are the, the equation, the, the Navier-Stokes equation, uh, so the equation that describes fluid motion. Um, the, 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 the equation of Navier-Stokes equation uh, for a compressible fluid, so as associated with compression. So, so they're the, the classic equation of a, of a fluid, uh, and then we have to account for, for other aspects specific of the of the Earth atmosphere. So we have to account for the fact that there is there is rotation. So rotation plays a very important role in in, in the type of behavior we see. Uh, so, for example, with straight wind. So you you take the Navier-Stokes equation. You add, you add rotation, and then uh, what the last, th the, the last things you need to do is basically account for water vapor and condensation. Uh, and so depending on, on, on oh, what type of model you want, you, you, need, you need some way of accounting for that, uh, either by, by actually writing down the full equation for condensation. So you write the equation of state, and then you, you, you have to do all of that. The set of equations, usually you end up with a set of five or six equations uh, different, so there's, diff there's partial differential equation. They're pretty, pretty complicated. That's why we need, we need very large computer to try to solve them. Uh, there's also a long tradition of basically you take the, this equation and then you, you, you process them mathematically to find reduced set of equations that are easier to solve mathematically or numerically. You yes. said, uh, in, uh, to answer one of the questions, that uh, the weather prediction is going to become better and better in the future. So the question is, is that, let's say there are three factors contributing to that. Maybe there are more. Let's mm -hmm. say the power of the supercomputer or the computer mm -hmm. uh, power, horsepower that you have, the quality of the data based on, mm -hmm. let's say, satellite imaging and other things. Or, and the third one would be the algorithm that you're using to do the modeling using uh, this data. Yeah. Which one of this, assuming these are three critical factors, which one do you think is more important than the others, if you want to rank them? Um, I think, I think they're, 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 all, they're all important. I mean, and I'm not, I'm not in the, 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 the forecasting business. I'm, I guess, more on the mathematical side. So I have, I have a preference for let's try to improve the algorithm and so on. And I think for certain issues like the, the, these very long range uh, forecast, I think there is a lot of things that has to do with understanding what it is to make this extended range forecast. So, so I think this is one of the area where actually we need, we need better math and we need better mathematical understanding of the forecasting problem. Uh, but for many cases, so for example, so like uh, forecasting hurricane intensity, some of the having better data uh, might, be, might be very useful and, and I think a lot of things, so for example, there is region of the, 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 the world where there is very little observation in general. So if you look over the ocean, so there is a lot of data missing. So better observation will, will, be, will, be, will, will, be, will be useful. Uh, what's very exciting over the last 10, 15 years is that we, we've received, we started to gather a lot of information from satellites. And, and there is, there is a, a huge amount of information coming from satellites in think way. We, we, we slowly learning, we, we've been learning over the last 20 years how to make use of these to, to basically improve, improve, improve forecast. Thank you. Um, my question is about the, uh, the influence of the water circulation in the oceans uh, first. And uh, the um, subsequent question is, uh, in the way uh, this circ uh, atmospheric circulation has been modeled, um, what is the, uh, how I can say, the, the boundary limit? Is it water or the land is just disturbance because we have 
uh, height effect with mountains, for example, which may force, in a, in a way, the, uh, the circulation in... Um, so, so the first part of the question has to do with the role of the ocean. And, and I mean, the, the ocean play a big role in the climate system. Uh, there has been some argument back and forth over the last 15, 20 years of how important is the dynamics of the ocean uh, for, for like variability at different time scale. Uh, to explain the, 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 the mean climate of the Earth, I think the ocean are very important. They are associated with an energy transport, uh, which is quite significant. It's not as large as what the atmosphere does, but it does transport a lot of, of, a lot of energy. And of course, you, you, you feel the effect of the ocean if you live by, by, by the sea versus if you live more inland. There is a lot of, of local effect associated with the ocean. There is also a very important role of the, the heat capacity of the, of the, of the ocean. Uh, which, which play a big role in, in, in the, the, the temperature fluctuation between winter and summer. Uh, one of the products in that regard is, so, so if you look at the, the, the average temperature of the Earth is warmer during the summer in the northern hemisphere, even though that's a time where the Earth is actually the furthest away from, 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 uh, from the sun, and that's to do with the heat capacity of the ocean. Uh, so definitely, I mean, if you, if you try to understand the climate system, you, you, have, to include, you, have, you have to include the ocean. Uh, at least you understand the mean climate. Um, the other part is has to do with, with basically what do we do with land and, and these various models, and that, that really depends on, on what, uh, a lot of this modeling effort depends on, on what you're trying to do and represent. Uh, so if you try to do a weather forecasting, you don't need, I mean, so, so for example, for weather forecasting, you want to account for topography and how topography affect, affect the wind. Uh, if you have something like the Tibetan Plateau, it's associated with large fluctuation of the wind circulation. Same thing every time you have a major uh, uh, mountain range, it will have a big impact on, on the atmospheric circulation around it. Um, if, you are in, if you're interested in, in doing more like climate simulation and things like that, then you really want to, to go in more detail, so try to basically account for how much moisture there is in the land, uh, how, much, how much heat capacity is associated with the land, and so on. So there is uh, all the the center, the research center that do, do modeling of, of, of climate, uh, I, I usually have a component that's trying to account for how to represent the effect, the effect of the land. But this is, this is a very difficult problem because we, we, we don't necessarily know exactly uh, the equation that the land should, should follow. So, so, so that, that's a rather difficult problem, but, but it's, it's part of, part of the problem.